I got a request recently to discuss the relationship between socialism, communism, and American progressivism. And I want to answer this by reframing the question as, why won't socialism go away? After all, if you reject the rational and moral arguments for capitalism, which are objective fact, the economic argument is a no-brainer. So what the hell are these socialists thinking? Don't they have eyes? But to answer this question, we gotta go all the way back to 400 BC Greece, because it was ultimately Plato's metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics that justified collectivism and are still influential to this day. Basically, it all started when Socrates went around questioning the children of ancient Greece. Socrates could not determine if something was pious because it pleased the gods, or if something pleased the gods because it was pious. In other words, where the hell do abstractions come from? This is what is called the problem of universals. And the legendary philosopher Plato sought to answer this question. Plato came along and was all like, well, you see, there are two realities. There's this reality here on Earth, where everything is imperfect. Look at that banana over there, for instance. Today it's yellow and nice, but tomorrow it's going to be brown and rotten. Ugh, what garbage. But then there's this other reality, the reality of universals, where everything is perfect. And we must have been there before we were born because we all know what a perfect banana looks like. Nothing changes in the reality of universals. And we must have come to this garbage reality from the reality of universals when we were born. Anyway, this reality is just a reflection of the reality of universals into an empty space. It's like living in a dark cave, where men can only see shadows cast from a fire from within inside the cave. They don't know what the hell is going on, but the philosopher is the one that leaves the cave to explore reality. The reality of universals, where everything is bright and lit and perfect, where man can see himself for who he really is. But then the philosopher goes back into the cave to tell all of the idiots what's up. But when he goes back inside, his senses are all off because he was just in the reality of universals where everything was lit and now everything is dark. So he's stumbling around like an idiot and he can't explain himself to these morons because he has little point of reference. So all of the dum-dums in the cave think the philosopher philosopher is crazy. Sound familiar? So, to sum things up, Plato believed that there were two realities, that knowledge is innate, and that we only get a distorted version of reality through our senses of this corrupt reality. Knowledge is only possible by exploring the reality of universals, the universals being the real world. Men should strive to seek knowledge by exploring the reality of universals. Plato also had a disdain for this reality here on Earth. He thought that that people were dumb and incapable of learning. Additionally, Plato believed that since reason meant abstaining from emotion, and since avoiding emotions is impossible, that essentially, it's impossible for man to be completely reasonable. As a result of this, Plato's ethics had a disdain for indulgences like feasting, sex, drugs, and wealth creation, for it corrupts the soul and makes man miserable. Our mind and soul are corrupted by the fact that they are in contact with our corrupt physical bodies in this imperfect world. Things like happiness and money and pleasure further corrupt the mind, which should ultimately strive toward knowledge, meaning exploring the world of universals, which ultimately means death. Plato's ethics are pro-death. As a result, we get Plato's philosophy of politics, which, long story short, Plato believed that because people were too dumb and too corrupt and too irresponsible to be left alone, that they need philosopher kings to rule over them and tell them how to live using a legion of soldiers. According to Leonard Peikoff, Plato's book, The Laws, was essentially a blueprint for every dictatorship since ancient Greece, from medieval theocracies to communism 
to Nazi Germany. And anyone that wants to learn more about the history of philosophy can check out the links down below. But put aside Plato's politics because it's his metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics that matter the most. Socialists, communists, and American progressives all share Plato's epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics on some level. The common denominators being a pessimistic view of humanity, a disdain toward life and reality, contempt for money and indulgence, and perhaps most importantly, that only the universal form of man is real. For Karl Marx, your class is real. For Adolf Hitler, the race is real. For Christians, God is real. And for American progressives, society as a whole is real. For progressives, society as a whole is what matters the most. To quote progressive John Dewey, Education, in its broadest sense, is the means of this social continuity of life. Every one of the constituent elements of a social group in a modern city, as in a savage tribe, is born immature, helpless, without language, beliefs, ideas, or social standards. Each individual, each unit who is the carrier of the life experience of his group, in time passes away. Yet the life of the group goes on. Now it's important to define the differences between the communists, socialists, and progressives. Communists and socialists ultimately have the same end goal of abolishing private property and establishing public control over the means of production. They just have a different means of achieving it. Communists want to achieve it by revolution, via forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Socialists want to achieve it by democracy, by vote, although I'm sure many socialists would approve of a revolution as well. As Ayn Rand states, it's merely a difference between societal murder and suicide. American progressivism is pragmatism. Since capitalism remained popular in 19th century America and because most people in the middle and even the lower class own property and because life was so good, the progressives had to pay lip service to capitalism and American values, but nonetheless advocated for tough business regulation, trust busting, and relatively small-scale wealth redistribution and social programs in comparison to communism. Often with disingenuous justifications like saving capitalism or preserving the American way of life. But let's look at Marxist metaphysics and epistemology. Marx says, It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. Society does not consist of individuals, but expresses the sum of interactions, the relations in which individuals stand. Marx viewed all of human history as a struggle between oppressors and the oppressed. And now capitalism has created created a new class struggle between the property owners who use their wealth and power to oppress the working class. Naturally, Marx viewed that money corrupted people. It transforms fidelity into infidelity, love into hate, hate into love, virtue into vice, vice into virtue, blah, 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 blah. Marx said that money distorts reality. But above everything else, money enables people to buy property which means oppression. So anyone who desires money must be corrupt and immoral. Now, if you operate from this dumb premise, you'll conclude that people cannot be trusted to live free and be left alone, or else people will start making money and buying property and oppressing those who don't have money, thus creating a class struggle. Therefore, we need philosopher kings to make everything right. But let's jump to the progressive metaphysics. As progressive economist John R. Common states in his 19th century book, The Distribution of Wealth, private self-interest is too powerful or too ignorant or too immoral to promote the common good without compulsion. Because progressives operate from the premise that individuals are corrupt, Progressives don't believe that businessmen and corporations can be trusted in a free market. Or else they'll just cut corners on engineering buildings, they'll try to sell rotten food to customers, they'll take advantage of workers, they'll dump toxic 
sunk waste into rivers. Not to mention if they get too much money, they'll form trusts and monopolies. They'll keep purchasing more and more land. They'll buy off politicians. Additionally, because individuals are naturally corrupt, progressives think that the working class is too stupid to leave to their own devices or else they'll just get exploited. They won't act responsibly and put money away for retirement. They'll waste money on indulgences rather than invest in their kids' education. They won't buy health insurance until they get hit by a bus, and so on and so on. Another telling quote from John Dewey, their energy of intelligence is so feeble and inconstant that it is constantly overpowered by bodily appetite and passion. Such persons are not truly ends in themselves for only reason constitutes a final end. Like plants, animals, and physical tools, they are means, appliances, for the attaining of ends beyond themselves. Although, unlike them, they have enough intelligence to exercise a certain discretion in the executions of the tasks committed to them. Thus, by nature, and not merely by social convention, there are those who are slaves, that is, means for the ends of others. So, naturally, progressives demand a big government, in other words, a philosopher king, to keep the robber barons and businesses in line with tough regulations. But also, the philosopher king needs to help out the working man and the lower class people by taking their money to set aside for retirement and force everyone to buy health insurance and pay for public schools. We also need wealth redistribution because... Who can trust private charity to help out the poor and unfortunate? People are too corrupt and immoral. They won't donate to charity. After all, we're all in this together, and we as a society need to take care of each other. We're all just part of one larger collective, American society. Again, back to the metaphysics, that's what they all have in common. The only difference between the three is the degree or method that they're willing to apply their ideas. It's important to note that even if people are not explicitly progressive or socialist or communist, if they share any of these views of altruism, collectivism, hatred of money, duty to country, pessimism about people in general, then it's difficult for them to challenge these political ideologies. Consider that nobody bats an eye when scum like Timothy McVeigh get the death penalty. If you think that greed and selfishness are immoral and as a result hate corporations and the top 1%, then what do you care if the government takes their money? Or even worse, if the government throws them into a gulag? In order to end socialism, we ultimately need to challenge these Bullshit premises that so many people hold. Now, how do these ideas gain steam in America? After all, America is a country that was founded on Aristotelian philosophy and extensions thereof. Aristotle, for those who don't know, came right after Plato and essentially said, yeah, all of this is garbage. There's only one reality. Truth is objective. There are only particulars and in individuals. There are only two genders. Okay, you didn't say that last part. Here's some logic and the scientific method. Then Isaac Newton came along and was all like, Aristotle is the shit. Here's some physics and calculus. And then John Locke came along and was all like, hell yeah, individual rights kick ass. Then Thomas Paine came along and was all like, religion fucking blows. It constantly leads to tyranny and ruins people's minds. And then the founding fathers were all like, hell yeah, let's let people live free. Then the blacks were all like, oh cool, no more slavery. And then the founders were all like, yeah, about that. Uh, we're with you, but too many dumb white folks aren't ready for abolition. So... Get back to work! So what went wrong in America? Leonard Peikoff explains everything in his book, The Ominous Parallels. If you've been following Sargon of Akkad, you're probably familiar with this book. You're welcome, Carl. Anyway, according to The Ominous Parallels, a German douchebag by the name of Immanuel Kant came along and was all like, All right, enough of this reason crap. 
Science is destroying religion. I need to save faith by destroying reason. So Kant challenged Aristotle by expanding on Plato's philosophy. By attacking reason, reality, and happiness, Kant essentially laid the philosophical foundations for thinkers like George Hegel, who further attacked logic and reality, Karl Marx, a man who needs no introduction, and other collectivist, anti-reason, anti-logic philosophers. And everyone in Europe during the 19th century was all like, wow, this is some interesting stuff. Fuck Aristotle, Newton, Locke, and the rest of the Enlightenment thinkers. What did they ever do for us? They only brought back science and eroded Christian theocracy and established individual freedom. Pfft. That's old news. Kant, Hegel, and Marx are the real deal. And then Europe got two world wars, communism, fascism, and a bunch of concentration camps as a result. Whoopsie daisy! But because America's secondary education system was lagging behind Europe during the 19th century, many American students and professors studied abroad in Europe, discovered Kant, Hegel, Marx, and other anti-reason thinkers and were all like, wow, this is some interesting stuff. Fuck the founding fathers and capitalism and brought those ideas back to American universities. Aside from Peikoff, multiple sources note that most American progressives were college educated. So why question them? After all, they went to college and know more than the uneducated industrial workers and the dumb peasant farmers. But hey, we're fighting for you, said the American progressives to the American peasant class. These robber barons are making off like bandits. Why trust them? And you're all too dumb to notice or take care of yourselves. This is all wrong. We need to put smart people in charge to make everything right. To make matters worse, the so-called free market, constitution-loving conservatives also accept platonic philosophy in the form of Christianity, or sometimes Judaism, and therefore are unable to effectively challenge their ideological enemies. Take Ben Shapiro, for instance. So, no, 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 right. but anyone that's basing anything on religion is just basing but that's something true. On, on, on some unproven thing. That is so I would say true. I want that nothing to do with my life. That which is which is fine, and yeah. that's why we live in America, good. Yeah. You know, but, but, but I will say this, every belief system is based on something unproven, all of them. Human rights means nothing. Where do you get the, your basis of human rights? From a feeling, how about that? Well, exactly, I just which is subjective. Right? What the fuck? <laughs> Well, that sucks, given that Shapiro is a follower of Aristotelian Jewish scholar Rabbi Maimonides. The fact is that Aristotle's ethics were pretty weak, which is why Kant was able to succeed. But if only Ben Shapiro were exposed to a philosopher who justified objective truth and objective morality. For someone who speaks a lot about morality, it seems like you don't, uh, it seems like you avoid acknowledging Ayn Rand, and I'm wondering, would you agree to debate someone like Yaron Brook or any objectivist? I'd love to talk to Yaron Brook, sure. Okay. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think that Ayn Rand's take on what drives capitalism is correct. Her take on uh, applying that to human nature and interrelationships between human beings, I think is more of a problem. I what the fuck? As Peikoff explains, must men resign themselves to total skepticism? No, says Kant, there is one means of piercing the barrier between man and existence. Since reason, logic, and science are denied access to reality, the door is now open for men to approach reality by a different, non-rational method. The door is now open to faith. Taking their cue from their needs, men can properly believe, for instance, in God and in an afterlife, even though they cannot prove the truth of their beliefs. And no matter how powerful the rational argument against their faith, that argument can always be dismissed out of hand. One need merely remind its advocate that rational knowledge and rational concepts are applicable only to the world of appearances, not to reality. Every belief system is based on something unproven. All of them. Human rights means nothing. 
Where do you get the, your basis of human rights? From a feeling. How about that? Well, exactly. Just Which is subjective. I... This is why in America, Democrats and liberals constantly use religious imagery to intellectually disarm the so-called free market Republicans because most Republicans are devout Christians. And Christianity is inconsistent with capitalism. It doesn't help that many Republicans preach Christian morality when it comes to marriage law, teaching evolution in schools, censorship of pornography, and other blue laws. But hey, maybe Christianity wouldn't be such a big influence if it weren't for... So to wrap things up, the relationship between progressives, socialists, and communists is their common metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. They see everything in collectives. They say things like, we're all in this together. Additionally, they all have a pessimistic view of people and a disdain of human nature. Fundamentally, they all believe that people are too immoral and or too stupid to be trusted, to live free. Look no further than today's gun debate. And as a result, we need a philosopher king who knows better than everyone to tell them how to live and to set everything straight using a legion of soldiers. The only difference is the degree of statism. And as Ayn Rand states, in any conflict between two men or two groups who holds the same basic principles, it is the more consistent one who wins. Therefore, it's difficult, if not impossible, for a progressive to effectively challenge a communist given that the communist is taking the progressive's views to their extreme logical conclusion. Hence why the American progressive movement has officially evolved into explicit it's socialism in the form of Bernie Sanders. And its logical conclusion is complete dictatorship of the proletariat. <laughs>